All right, so then we will move to the last talk of the day, and according to the program, it will be a very short talk, but I think it's a, it's a small mistake in the program, so I think we should give Tobias 40 minutes as the other speakers. And Tobias Schiff from uh, Freiburg University will talk about ions and atoms trapped by light towards chemistry in the nano regime. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, of course, thank you very much, Peter and Chris, uh, for having me here. And also thank you very much for the audience for at least giving me the impression that you don't suffer too hard to get me twice uh, the time. Um, I <coughs> want to focus here on the ions and the atoms trapped by light. And what I have here is the first slide is showing recent results. And uh, some people uh, might laugh here because it's rubidium 87 that we have here, the fluorescence light out of our light lab of rubidium 87. So atoms, some people might say this is not even but for us, it's a big step. So we have neutral atoms now. And this is a survivor, let's say. It's a magnesium 24 plus ion that had been trapped by an optical dipole trap and at the end detected against by fluorescence light. So it's not while optical trapping, but after all. So what I want to do here is uh, to somehow bridge the gap to that what you all want to hear, to somehow uh, <coughs> combine this with the molecular experiments, but perhaps even beyond that. Um, for doing that, we might want to exchange the magnesium 24 plus but by a barium um, ion because it's much heavier and if we want to get sympathetic cooling, and I will uh, also discuss that a little bit later, um, of course we need a heavier ion than the sympathetic cooling agents, the rubidium 87. And, and this is a slight side effect out of the lab, we also have to combine the two systems. And I want to say something about that. Um, of course, one needs an outline, and uh, this is, uh, after a short motivation, I want to uh, tell you how far we are with the atomic system, and I try to put in some honesty there. Um, I uh, want to tell you about the ionic system, and I, I'm tired of talking about challenges. Uh, there are handicaps, and we have to master them. And uh, we, uh, I want to show you then some of the results we had achieved with ions in an optical dipole trap. So pure optical trapping using some DC fields and then also in a standing wave where we purely optically trap the ions but <clears throat> also need of course additional DC fields to correct for stray fields and so on but in principle it works without any DC fields. Um, if we talk about standing waves we could think about of many motivations. Uh, Vladan was already pointing out some of those but in principle one could also think about using these uh, standing waves, not as standing waves, but as conveyor belts to bring together ions and atoms and to stop and uh, start interactions at will. Okay, but uh, yeah, so this is the dream part, so to say. And then we have to merge the systems and, uh, well, and to find good reasons to do this again and again and to end up with a functional system doing reasonable physics in there. So the optical dreaming part one is coming from the quantum simulation part. Uh, our group was focusing mainly on quantum simulations and that's why our first application for the optical trapping or some of the motivation also came from there. We were somehow, I wouldn't say jealous, but there are beautiful uh, experiments done by people working with atoms and optical lattices. And one can think of, dream of at least in first place, of having ions in optical lattices. Of course, not of course, but dependent on the depth of the lattices, and the lattices don't provide that much confinement that up to now that you um, would have every lattice space taken, but there would be empty lattice spaces between the ions. But you could use the long range interaction between the ions in an uh, optical lattice and then do quantum simulations quite along the way of the spin models or, uh, uh, or well, Hamiltonians uh, similar to that. And there's an additional uh, beauty, one might think, uh, that you don't have to take ions purely, but you can take atoms and, let's say, one ion, or a uh, uh, much smaller density of ions in the optical lattice. By that, you would have every lattice space taken and take advantage now of the long-range interaction between the ions and the atoms uh, due to one of the R to the four potentials. And there are some, uh, some uh, proposals, <laughs> uh, Peter Solo told me they are in his drawer, uh, whatever that means. I think he has more interesting things to do right now, but let's see what he says if we get the ions and the atoms really together in an optical 
device and then one might be able to use the charge here to tunnel between the atoms and the ions and to simulate things like Bose-Hubbard, like Hamiltonian using the atoms and the ions. Um, speaking of quantum simulations, I um, don't want to hide here that we are still uh, following our approach doing uh, quantum simulations in surface traps and uh, with a huge group of uh, helpers, helping hands and uh, collaborators, we are addressing this problem that is, or problem, yeah, yeah the problem of uh, storing ions in individual RF traps above surfaces at a distance of, of the order of 40 microns, as we saw today, also by the NIST results, there should be already uh, sufficient coupling um, to, uh, to do some first steps towards these 2D simulations. And here I should emphasize the collaboration with NIST, uh, mainly Didi Leibfried, with Basel, Roman Schmid, and Sandia that provided us up to now with two beautiful surface traps. One of the surface traps is uh, the reason why this is not uh, trapping probably up to now, because we implemented the, or realized the other setup before, and there we are eager to um, to implement the proposal that Alejandro Bermudez was uh, um, uh, introducing to you uh, about sympathetically cooling while doing a gate. So with uh, Alejandro and also with Diego Porras together, we are addressing these topics. Uh, don't need this. Okay, and then you might have seen the slight change here from times two to times three. So if we get really to our <laughs> approach that gives us a basic triangular lattice, one might think of larger arrays, triangular arrays, that gives a uh, playground for larger extended, I wouldn't say scalable, but perhaps even scalable uh, quantum simulations in surface traps. But now let's come back to the motivation of, uh, uh, that I'm um, invited to tell you about here. And this is uh, uh, let's say based on the idea of the seminal work in the, Vladan, uh, in the group of Vladan from 2009 where he invented the hybrid trap to, uh, invented, I should be careful, hybrid trap, <laughs> but where you used and uh, did beautiful experiments. Smith yeah, right, so. Um, and uh, using atomic uh, neutral atoms uh, in a cold mod, for example, interacting with an ion um, that is stored in an RF trap. And as Fladan has already pointed out, and I didn't know that you would talk about this, so I can shorten my talk a little bit, um, uh, that you would talk about it. There's this sinusoidal motion that you get due to the pseudo-potential, but on top of that you get this micro-motion, and this micro-motion screws up um, some of the beauty of this approach. I would still say there are impressive proposals and beautiful results that are in reach and uh, because you don't have to go to S-Wave, to the S-Wave regime in every experiment and you don't have to head toward non-equivalent temperatures, but if you want to go to these uh, very cold temperatures, just using really the full uh, coldness of this path of atoms, <coughs> then these, uh, uh, these uh, collisions between the ions and the, um, and the atoms and the uh, RF field putting energy into the system is probably raising the temperatures too high. And you might remember this transparency, you can go over it uh, quickly and just say that um, also Murray Barrett's group in Singapore did some interesting quantum <coughs> approach on the, on the RF treatment, on the micromotion treatment, and also found some interesting work to be done there. So this, I think this RF uh, Micromotion doesn't have to be seen as a cur pure curse, and you, of course you don't, and a lot of people don't, so you can use it for a lot of things. But if you are heading towards these ultra-cold temperatures, shouldn't call it ultra-cold, but because I still don't know what ultra-cold means, but in the nano-Kelvin regime, then it might be that this optical trapping approach provides some advantages. And there should be better some advantages, because ion traps, RF pole traps, have some other beautiful advantages. If you look at this potential here, of course, my particles are within this potential, then one shouldn't forget that a typical potential depth in an RF trap is of the order of an E volt. So this is 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And here we have of the order of a millikelvin, or 10 millikelvin perhaps. So this is quickly six orders of magnitude less step deep. So why should one exchange? <coughs> Sorry for saying this. Shouldn't have said? Okay. Um, so the atomic system, this is only one slide. For me, it's beautiful because it's the first neutrals we have in the laboratory. 
Um, for you, it might seem lame. And in addition, it's not a 3D mod you are seeing here, but it's a 2D plus mod. Um, and you see here uh, cuts through the, the, showing the fluorescence light and dependence of the pics. So it's not important. The important thing is that we have the 2D plus mod working. And so we have the lasers and we have everything in place to now use this 2D plus mod to load a 3D mod inside the pole trap. This has to be done. Hasn't been done up to now. I hope my guys are working at home hard. Not yet anymore. But um, uh, then the atoms has, perhaps don't have to for first experiments. The temperature that we might reach in the mod might be sufficient of 50 microkelvins to do nice experiments in first place. But then we want to transfer the atoms into a dipole trap and let's call BEC it. The reason why I'm still thinking that this is beautiful for us but not so interesting for you is that there are recipes out there how to do this all optically. Once again, for example, done by Murray Barrett in 2011 and it seems like we could follow this recipe. Okay. So let's talk now about the Ionic system and why, uh, why is it not that easy to directly load from a, to directly load an, um, an optical trap, a mod or an, uh, a dipole trap with ions. And here I summarize, so to say, the, 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 the outline again that has to be uh, targeted if we want to talk about these challenges. So a first approach was that we have to consider or we thought we should better think of the effect of the electromagnetic field of the light <coughs> on the charge of the ion. So ions and atoms seem pretty similar, but there is still a charge in an electromagnetic field fluctuating. So there is something like micromotion also in an optical dipole trap. For atoms, we don't care, but the charge of the ions might play a role. You might say the frequency of the electromagnetic field, typically 10 to the 15, 10 to the 14 hertz, is so much higher than the frequency of the, um, of the motion of the ions, that this is really good, well decoupled. But still we are talking about here the tiniest effects to screw uh, nano-Kelvin, sub-micro-Kelvin temperature regime, so one should better think of all effects that might uh, screw before building an ex uh, expensive apparatus. And here with, in collaboration with Giovanna Morici, we found out that there should be no showstopper um, using ions in dipole traps. Well then, as a next step, we have to compensate stray fields. In our case, not to compensate micromotion. So micromotion in the optical dipole trap, as I told you, will be of no influence as long as the RF fields are off. So if we have purely optically trapped ions, there is no micromotion. But still the stray fields might push our ions out of the tiny optical confinement, out of the tiny optical traps. Uh, the, the, somehow some good information about this is that we have to have the forces of the stray fields being small to the dipole forces. If you look again at the difference in the order of magnitude of the depth, that sounds scary, but of course the force is the gradient of the potential. And therefore, since you can focus your laser down by a lot, you get much steeper gradients, even so the potential depth is not that huge. So it's not about the potential depth, but it's more about the gradient you can reach. And here uh, we are at a level where, and this is where we'll later come to with our realization on magnesium and also for the barium, where we are at the level where you, we can compensate the stray fields well enough. Uh, it uh, should be said, and I don't know whether I understood your paper correctly, to reach these levels of uh, minimal collisional exchange, one is still an order of magnitude off in the compensation of stray fields from point of view that also we reach. So, if we did everything with the stray field compensation and look at Vladan's result of the PRL he was uh, introducing to you or showing to you again, then we would be a factor of 10 off still. So we would have to win in this, uh, in this stray field compensation still. For the optical trapping, we should be fine right now. Then there are other uh, uh, effects that I want to discuss, so I would just stop with these effects and talk briefly about these two, about the smooth reduction of the RF and the DC potentials. So we can't just simply switch off the trap. And uh, when we are switching it off, uh, we have to think about he additional heating effects uh, in addition. So, and as I said, we start with magnesium 24. Here are almost only ion trappers, so I don't have to say any almost anything about this stability diagram, just that we 
normally or all experimentalists focus on this part of the stability diagram. I don't know of any experiments that took place in the other parts of potential stable orbits. So, but if you look at this, uh, pardon, was there something? Yeah, it's interesting. What, whom are you pointing to? You thought anyway. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Me? Okay, I have to talk to myself again. Uh, okay. Are you kidding me? Why? How is? Okay. 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 So this deformed stability diagram, if you look in a little bit more detail at it, it shows you already some of the of the trouble we get. And I, this picture is partially stolen from, I think, Dave for one of your talks. Uh, so. Please, uh, well, yeah. Um, uh, you see here the dependence in the stability of the DC field you might apply and the RF field you might apply. And here you have your A and Q. And then it's interesting to see that this uh, stability diagram doesn't go to zero anymore as soon as you apply DC fields, for example, for the actual confinement in a linear pole trap. Uh, why is this so? Well, you if you add focusing forces along one dimension, you have defocusing forces in, in, in other dimensions. And therefore, well, the defocusing here is getting too huge. And therefore, you would lose ions if you are at this low RF confinement. In addition, if you apply too large DC fields, or if the DC fields in your trap are too large because of patch potentials or anything, then you get defocusing forces that give uh, zero trapping frequency along the x and the y axis. Here, these lines are in addition interesting because they uh, occur because of um, parametric driving the ions. So if the secular frequency is just um, half of the RF frequency, then you can put additional energy into the system and it's not stable. And, uh, and the system, the ion is not stable anymore in this confinement. So if you would switch off your RF trap, you are most probably not just along the zero line, but even if you are on this zero uh, in DC voltages, you don't reach, uh, because switching off the RF voltage just means here we go to lower and lower Q values, we will leave the stability diagram before we reach zero. This is even more evil than it looks like because it doesn't mean that you are not trapped anymore, but you have defocusing forces now by the RF too. So there is no stable orbit anymore. So if you cross this line here, by whatever evolution you do while switching off your, your trap, you have to have an optical trap already that is capable of, uh, of, of taking care of that by its focusing forces. But to be that's only if you have a DC voltage on your two diagonal electrodes compared to the other ones. I mean, if you only have, if the, you if you only have the, the actual confining DC potential, then you don't have well, a zero point. Uh, you don't have a zero, but it depends on how you uh, provide the actual confinement. If you use, for example, two, we have segmented electrodes and we use, let's say, just uh, two segmented pairs okay. on the end caps, so to say it's not symmetrically round. Right. Then, but in, even if not, you get defocusing field. If you focus along the axis, you just provide the defocusing perhaps symmetrically. But then you're not doing the shift. So what you see here is DC forces uh, against, uh, against our stability. And what you can see here, and this is, let's say, the three uh, dimensions in, 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 in units of the, um, of the beam waste that we use for optical trapping. And now we consider also for the stability the DC confinement or deconfinement. And you see here this egg-like shaped thing, and that is an equipotential cave, let's say, and within, within this, the ion can be trapped stably by these optical and DC forces. If we now change the direction of our laser beam or increase the DC confinement along one axis, we bite holes here into our con uh, in our confinement and ions can escape out of the confinement. Even so, you might calculate that the, um, that the optical potential is deep enough to store it. So there are ways out of it. Either you choose your DC voltage low enough uh, and nature ch chose to put the stray fields small enough that you comp can compensate for it well enough that the DC fields don't bite these holes into your uh, potential cave. Or you can use a standing wave instead, so providing the, the, uh, the actual confinement by, uh, by optical forces again. Okay. Um, the stability di diagram, in addition, is a, 
I should say, a very interesting um, uh, environment because if you look in more detail, and Günther Wert did this already in 2006, into the stability diagram, you realize all of a sudden that there are a lot of resonances coming from higher order RF terms in your trap. So you have octopole terms and so on, and you hit, I would call these also parametric resonances. I think these are the parametric resonances of the higher order components. And what we normally do in our experiments is we sit somewhere where we don't hit any resonance and do a, our experiments there. And one sees that uh, a perfectly patient ion sitting here and uh, blinking at us is getting pretty nervous as soon as we cross one of these resonances and sit on it. So once again, if we want to switch off our F-trap, we have to avoid sitting on these resonances for too long because then we put energy into the system by these parametric resonances. Um, in addition, we have to think about switching off the trap not too fast, so we want to come over these resonances quickly, but we are not allowed to be too fast. One technical reason is that we have a resonator, uh, RF resonator that stores and it has a certain Q factor and therefore stores some energy in it. So if we switch it off, this resonator has a ring down time. And this takes something like a microsecond to really get sufficiently the power out of this resonator. So the ring down is here, is some issue. Um, but in addition, if you think about superimposing a dipole trap and an RF trap, of course you might think the best thing is to have the zero, the, the origin at the same spot. And this is true, of course, but you will never have in the experiment. So if you have the uh, potential minima displaced by a little bit, you want to turn off the RF potential adiabatically that the ion can shift to the not to the zero of the optical potential. If you do it too fast, you start already with a huge excitation or you can't trap optically at all. So you are somehow, uh, on the, you have to be fast on the timescales crossing these resonances and short uh, on, uh, and, and adiabatic in uh, loading your optical and loading your optical trap. And what we did, and this is the protocol of the optical trapping for the dipole trap, for the uh, standing wave it's pretty similar. We first used the pole trap, so we still need a pole trap, for example for the stray field compensation. We uh, load our pole trap and do Doppler pre-cooling uh, down to one millikelvin. By the way, probably the most striking reason why RF trapping was uh, decades earlier successful than optically trapping atoms because if the potential depth is only of the order of millikelvin then you have to pre-cool your, your particles. For the ions uh, the, optic, the potential was deep enough to store them already. And, but here we use of course Doppler cooling in addition to prepare the ions in a, in, uh, in at a temperature and the ensemble at a temperature that can be then trapped optically. And we do the stray field compensation because we can use different schemes to compensate stray fields. The most easiest one or the most simplest one works these days best for us. This is lowering the RF potential and looking whether the ion is displaced or not and then correcting for this displacement. The next step is then we switch on the dipole trap and we switch off the pole trap, not the DC fields here because the Rayleigh length is too long here of this laser beam focused down to here in this case five to six micrometers. So we need an additional confinement uh, along the K vector of the laser beam and this is provided by the DC fields. And then we are storing the ions optically for a certain amount of time and for detection and readout we switch on the pole trap again, switch off the optical trap and switch on the fluorescence detection again. And if we then see fluorescence light we know that the ion survived. The uh, ion of our choice it was magnesium-24, as I said, and it has a nuclear spin zero, so the energy level uh, uh, the system is pretty simple. The mean point about magnesium is 280 nanometers are required. Uh, good thing is, for example, D levels are not present here. They lie still above the P3 half and P1 half level. And what we do uh, to Doppler cool and for the detection of uh, the magnesium ions is using a cycling transition. Uh, for the dipole trap, we are shining in with a laser of much smaller waste, 7 microns, 200 milliwatt of UV power in one beam, and uh, detuned by 300 gigahertz, what sounds huge for, uh, sounded huge for me as an ion trapper, because it's 7,000 line width, the line width being 42 uh, megahertz. 
but is a sweet nothing for people doing normally optically trapping, trying to be far detuned, not to, uh, to scatter photons off resonantly. Um, but if we shine in this, uh, this light, we get the AC stark shift and focusing forces if we uh, red detune the laser. And the order of magnitude was 40 uh, millikelvin potential depth uh, with a corresponding radial, uh, let's say, secular frequency in this, opti in this optical potential of 200 kilohertz. And what we found as a result, and I just uh, want to go quickly over it because it, uh, this is out of 2010 already, we saw that if we take the optical trapping probability now, probability to see fluorescence light after doing the procedure of optically trapping, independence of the duration of the optical trapping, <laughs> so how long the, 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 the RF has been really off, we see that we get a lifetime of the order of 2.5 to 3 milliseconds. On the other hand, and this is also important, if we lower, and this is the optical trapping probability independence of the laser power, so here of the potential depth, if we lower the optical potential, then at zero uh, laser power, we also get no trapping. You might say this is obvious. Yes, it's obvious if you only have RF, the RF trap that you switched off and the optical trap, but there might be residual trapping fields, who knows? And we were pretty happy to see that everything is well describable in our model, only considering the optical and the RF trap. And what we saw is that the lifetime here, the 2.5 milliseconds, is, uh, can be still explained, as Vladan said or, uh, already, by the recoil heating we get due to not being far enough uh, off resonant. So we get uh, something like a scattering rate of one per microsecond. And if you take now a 40, 30 millikelvin deep trap, then it takes uh, 3,000 events of scattering to get you out, and this is then just three milliseconds. So this is still consistent with just uh, recoil heating, and therefore uh, we, we hope that by going to further detuning, larger detuning and larger laser power, so providing the same potential depth but less scattering, we get rid of this heating uh, of our ions. Still, it was uh, several hundreds of oscillations during this trapping period because it's the 200 kilohertz. And also the loading from the uh, RF trap into the dipole trap worked uh, and, uh, our resolution of millikelvin temperatures nicely. It will be hard to go to really low temperatures, but perhaps we don't have to do it that well because there might be atoms recooling us. We will see. And uh, uh, also that it's nice to see that the dipole trap, the optical dipole trap, works in combination with the DC trap that provides us some uh, defocusing forces. Okay. The standing wave I was referring to uh, was implemented here with two counter-propagating beams, so no cavity around. This is a big advantage that the, should be I here, that the AUS group and MIT group uh, um, have and also others will have implementing this in, in cavities that they get an enhancement of the laser power. Uh, for several reasons, uh, we didn't want to do this. Most of all, because I was already overwhelmed by all this uh, neutral atoms stuff. And then getting cavities in addition would have been a perfect reason for never getting results. But in addition, you get some beauty of the uh, approach if you have a, let's say, a, a convey still a conveyor belt and not something that is fixed between. Ah, ah OK. Um, so getting the standing wave requires that we get in polarization of the laser beams that is the same for that the ion can't distinguish uh, where, the ion, uh, where the photon comes from. And this is of some importance. If we, the protocol is the same as I showed to you for the dipole trap, but now for the, uh, for the standing wave, we should get deeper trapping potentials, right? And this is what we were after here. So we were once again uh, observing here the probability for recapture independence of the optical power of the laser beam. And what you see here is the trapping probability independence of, um, well, not independence, for the case where the two polarizations are different. So there should be no standing wave. There's just light coming from in front and behind to the eye and forming a dipole trap. And we can compare this to the recapture probability for the ions in the standing wave choosing the same polarizations. Here one has to be a little bit careful because the coupling to the, due to the klebsch gordon coefficients is slightly different, but we took this into account. And what we found then is that the trapping probability goes up here, so quite significantly, significantly um, for, the, for the standing wave. 
And here the heat, additional heating strikes in. So this is um, a, deep, a dipole fluctuation heating also due to our huge scattering rate that should normally not present for finely tuned lasers, but here it gives us additional heating. But what really disturbed us in the beginning is that even for higher laser power where the heating should get us a little bit, the recapture probability went much further down. And we thought we are perhaps running into some problems with some additional heating effects that we don't understand that will also uh, uh, compromise our future plans of whatever we might do. But then we looked in more detail in our trapping protocol again. And uh, if you look, this is the timeline, so to say, for our pulses. So we pulse on the two laser beams. Here, same polarization. And after having pulsed on the laser beams simultaneously, we switch off the RF field. What that means is that the dipole trap is on, so the standing wave is on, and the RF trap is on at the same time. When we then thought we understood what is happening, um, and I will explain, I hope I will explain it in, in a second, then uh, we switched our protocol, and here you can see that we switched on one laser beam first, providing a dipole trap, not a standing wave, using this time to switch off the RF potential, and after the VRF potential being off, we switched on the second laser beam of identical polarization providing the standing wave. And the results we achieved are in much better agreement with the, uh, with the theoretic prediction we should get in our standing wave. And the reason is the, the secular frequency here for these high laser powers is already of the order of 30 megahertz. So you had 15 megahertz, I think, in your standing wave, right? Was this is what you were in actual confinement? One meg oh, sorry, I uh, confused something. So with this 30 megahertz, our RF trap working at 60 megahertz, 57 megahertz, we have perfectly uh, possibility to excite the, uh, the secular trapping frequency here parametrically by our RF drive. And I would additionally say that it's not only the actual component of the RF that excites us, because it's a highly non-harmonic potential all of a sudden, and so the degrees of freedom gets coupled. So to get into the standing wave, we had to go over this, um, this burden to, um, to uh, load in the dipole trap first. I'm pretty sure one can avoid a lot of the trouble if one tries to run, for example, the, the <coughs> RF trap at very low frequencies and the, the standing wave, secular frequency, the high frequency. So but we'll have to be very careful not to have these uh, frequencies too much, too, or half of the frequency for parametric. Ex uh, excitation too close to each other. Okay. So if we, if then we think about merging the systems, we have to have different laser systems, and we have to have a different laser, um, different apparatus, and the different ion we want to use is barium plus, as I already said, barium has a mass of 138, rubidium 87. Rubidium is barium rubidium has several advantages. One of those is that already uh, very gifted groups like uh, Johannes Hecker Denschlag and, uh, and also theory groups like Krisch and uh, Moczynski worked on the system and already did predictions that let us hope that this is a good system for us if we really reach these ultra low temperatures. But barium, a beautiful ion, as a lot of uh, experimenters already experienced experience has some handicaps for us being magnesium uh, trappers. For example, the D levels here are shining up. If you then use a uh, laser beam to provide the dipole trap, uh, high power, good laser stability and so on, provided by 532 nanometers, then it provides us with a, a ready tuned trap for barium. So this should work, but then we have, if we scatter from time to time, or if we off resonantly excite these levels, we have some <coughs> probability to uh, scatter into the D levels. And so we have to re-pump out of the D levels, and they also are coupled to upper levels and therefore see some AC start shift. So I think we thought about a uh, cool scheme to avoid these uh, defocusing forces in the D levels now by uh, actively re-pumping quickly enough, uh, but we will have to test this. And as you can see here, there's an, another challenge that might be an advantage at some point. So if we choose something that provides us with a good reticuned trap for barium plus, then it's blue detuned for rubidium. Rubidium having its, its transition at 780 nanometers. And this is almost, a, in, in first place, a general curse. 
if you have an ion and an atom, you want to store them together and you want to be ready tuned to both of the resonant transitions, then the ion being ionized is normally of shorter wavelength. And therefore, being ready tuned of both, you are closer to rubidium or to the atom than to the ion. What does this mean? If you're thinking about the trapping potentials, the trapping potential for the atom will be deeper than for the ion. If you want to go for evaporative cooling, for example, this is a real handicap because you lower your potential, you evaporatively cool your atoms with the one single ion you evaporatively got rid of, and you're stuck with the rest of the atoms. So you need a way to get a deep trap for the barium, deeper trap for the barium than for the rubidium. And this is what we do, what we want to do in a bichromatic trap. So we just got the laser working at, another laser working at 1064 uh, nanometers. And here you can see what we would get for the Murray Barrett approach, uh, choosing the 1064 nanometers uh, uh, wavelength to uh, trap rubidium. And here the 532 nanometers on top to trap the barium. The, this one is blue detuned to uh, rubidium, as I said. That's why you deform here the potential of the rubidium atoms. Might have some advantage if you want to have some separations between the coolants and the ion, for example, for the purpose of reducing chemical reactions or reducing hardcore collisions, but getting still sympathetic cooling, having the rubidium atoms here and the barium ions in the center. But if you want to have them maximally over overlapped, you uh, just have to increase the laser power a little bit. And you see here this increase in the in this small increase in, in potential depth for the barium ion me means a lot for the rubidium ions just because they are closer to the 1064 nanometers. Okay. And therefore, we think then in this bichromatic trap, if we uh, are careful enough with a lot of additional uh, handicaps, for example, beam pointing is, of course, something that we have to think of if these two beams are not perfectly overlapped. That might even introduce heating if it's at the wrong frequency, so we have to stabilize the, the overlap here. But if this works out nicely, we should have the ions and the atoms overlap. Well, I don't have the time to talk about some uh, detection methods to measure the AC stark shift of the ions that we used, but I want to go to the outlook perhaps. And here I mainly want to, I don't want to discuss in detail these potential energy curves of barium rubidium. You see here barium plus and rubidium neutral coming in, forming uh, potential energy uh, curves for the molecular ions. And then the ground state is not shown here. You can also decay down into this uh, molecular level, then you did build a, um, a, a molecular ion of barium rubidium plus. You have elastic scattering rate, charge transfer rate, and this radiative decay. And these rates uh, look very promising for the barium rubidium system, as our collaborators uh, Robert Muschinski and Christiane Koch in Kassel calculated for us. And this is still also work in progress because we have to be very careful at this very low temperatures that we hope to reach, because you see here are very small potential bumps, right? And for a very cold iron, this means, uh, well, you might get, and this is also the beauty of this, uh, of this chemistry, you might get reflected by this potential bump, you might be able to tunnel through it, or you might be even able, if it's small enough, to control it from outside, not with magnetic field, but with electric fields. What would be cool to uh, control the interaction rates and the cross-sections by, by electric fields. Uh, there is also um, uh, work uh, by Dulieu and others in Paris and the Ulm group on this, what, what makes it a very promising system. Uh, also because this is not directly uh, attacking their targets because they won't work in this regime with barium and rubidium plus working with uh, RF traps as Vladan calculated. There's another outlook to be uh, talked about, and this goes back to a proposal of Coté and Lukin from 2002. And this should be something that comes along, and this picture is stolen out of this uh, proposal. And this comes along just with the uh, pure fact that the ion polarizes the, the atoms, for example, providing us with uh, additional micromotion if the ions and the atoms approach each other. But of course, we also want to have this as an interaction uh, potential between atoms and ions. And by this fact, having a BEC around, the BEC atoms should be captured, and quite a lot of those, should be captured in this potential and forming a huge 
molecular ion, but something like a barium plus and 600 rubidium atoms uh, in the core being still surrounded by this BC. And there are a lot of open questions to be addressed here. Uh, at some point, one might even uh, think about having not only one ion, and, and the optical confinement might be stiff enough to have perhaps two ions in, the, in this potential. And then if they are really getting cold and the De Broglie wavelength is getting huge, one might think of uh, what happens uh, if ions, De Broglie length gets huge, and the distance is all of a sudden comparable to that. Uh, I wouldn't call it a BEC because Roe might love them, but uh, I would call it something interesting. Okay, but this is an ongoing discussion with Coté and, and Lukin, and we are hoping to see also how to, which observables are available to detect this, because this should happen by itself. Just having an ion not being extracted by stray fields out of the BEC, this just, should just happen. So the question is then how to observe that it happened and how to measure uh, uh, characteristics of it. And one can think of having here an ion that has normally in the optical trap a certain secular frequency and then by this core of atoms, it gets an effective mass, and so the frequencies are changed, and therefore you can excite all of a sudden at a different frequency these, these objects. You can perhaps even translate them through the BEC and so on. Okay. With that, we have a lot of mean challenges, but brave students to address these challenges. And uh, here are, this is the old group from MPQ uh, that was our generous host until uh, January last year, and we moved to Freiburg in the meantime. And the guys, Martin Enderlein, Christian Schneider, now working in um, uh, Eric Hudson's group, and Thomas Huber, still working uh, with me, being a very good uh, PhD student, by the way. Um, they, are, uh, they were the working hands on this optical trapping experiment. Uh, the group in Freiburg now uh, got two additional students, Alexander Lambrecht and Julian Schmidt who uh, did the work now on the rubidium atoms and trying to combine the systems. He did, uh, Alexander Lambrecht did a uh, diploma thesis in the group of Helm, working with neutral atoms, and therefore he has already some experience with the neutral part, and therefore we think that we can combine the themes, the, 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 the topics pretty soon. Okay, here I already mentioned this collaborators, so I think I should better stop before the chairman gets too angry, and thank you for your Attention. Thank you, Tobias. Yeah. Can you see any tunneling um, of the ion you know, <coughs> through the sanding wave? Uh, the, the, uh, once again, your question whether we saw it or whether we are interested in it? Or? Can you see it? Like, yeah, it uh, no, we can't. So, Vladan might have the possibility to really resolve the position uh, between potential wells and the standing wave. We don't have this capability. So uh, having already two ions would be very interesting because then all of a sudden the tunneling gets correlated, of course, yeah. and then you get it. So this is, might be something that you might want to look at, probably, anyways. For us, it is uh, this, uh, the, to be honest, not having the cavity means already that our standing wave is chittering by quite a bit. We took care that the chitter is on uh, on a frequency scale that is not heating our system, so the ions can follow adiabatically. This is fine. But to get really a special resolution and to know then where the ion is, uh, that is tougher work that can be treated by experts. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I will. <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, it'll be a little goofy, more of a, maybe a comment. It's, it's, what's interesting to me is, is um, at this meeting and the last several years, there are um, lots of groups now mixing cold atoms and ions, and it's like all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's uh, just in the last few years, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm taken back in time, and Dave will laugh at this. 20, 20 years ago, we, we built a sodium mot and a little ion trap around it, and we were, it took, I mean, we, we were detecting the sodium ions just by image, by uh, currents, uh, you know, the currents, and we could detect a few hundred of them, and they were being produced as, as you expect. And it was sort of a, we described it as an apparatus looking for a problem, and we kind of, I remember we beat bushes to see if anybody <laughs> thought it was interesting. <laughs> and and, and uh, this all of a sudden, I mean, there, there's, there's mm -hmm. so many groups doing it. And what, what I'm, I guess my question is this, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is more appropriate for the next week when we have topical discussion group. 
but this is a, a, a meeting on quantum technology, or ion, yeah, ion, what is it? Is there a tool? I mean, is there? Uh, don't kill me here. You throw tomatoes at me. But is there like a tool behind this? I mean, is, it, is this going to be useful for? Useful for something? Yeah. So first of all, I, 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 let me uh, answer your first comments with a question. Was this written in the Bible that you did this with the sodium? Because if it's not, then it's not. Uh, no, of course. So sorry for not uh, for not mentioning no, it. I was just not aware of it. When Smith sort of years later, he, he, he took it over. So yeah, I, I didn't know. So for me, Smith was uh, the bad thing is normally you find the results you found to be new in the Bible after you read it again. But this I didn't find, so well, I thought this to is do it, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That day, is, but I think there are nice proposals out there how you could use the sympathetic cooling scheme also for cooling, uh, but also to do quantum gates. It's not directly that what we would be after. But uh, who was the godfather of this uh, proposal? Uh, so, so I didn't mention this uh, here to not give you the impression that we want to do all of this. So what we did is we trapped ions optically and we look at, we think the beauty one can do with it. Not everything, but there are gates, there are, so you can, if you think about, uh, Roy and me, we discussed this just, if you have two ions in, in, in an atom cloud already, the polarization between, is, so this is mediating some interaction, right? So. I, again, I'm, I don't, don't take it the wrong way, because I mean, I've had a, a kind of nascent interest in this for a long time. In Michigan, we were attempting to put together a program like this as well. And, and I just think maybe the community, uh, maybe think of things to, uh, I mean, the, the tools are amazing, and it's going to happen, and, and you'll be able to see these. I think you'll be able to get in the quantum limit eventually of these these C4 collisions, uh, Feshbach resonances, and so forth, eventually. So, I mean, mm -hmm. temperature has never been a problem in atomic physics. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just seems that with the technology coming in, the f in a few years, maybe we can anticipate what it could be useful for. I mean, really, really think, uh, think hard. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, I mean, it's not an indictment at all. I mean, I... I, I I, I think it's a fruitful area to pursue. Thanks. Thanks for turning around your first comment. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't turn around. I mean. Okay. More comments or questions? Yeah, I think you thank Tobias and all your speakers for having